Good to be here. Good to be with you. I wish I had my new glasses because I still can't see. I try to see the screen on my computer where I sit, and I found that if I take my glasses and tilt them up like this, that helps it a little bit. But then I look silly. My glasses sticking up, making my hair stand up. But anyway, silly for the Lord. Um, I had a prayer request written down upstairs. Uh, when we get to prayer request, I'll try to remember it. Uh, and I got a couple new ones here, some that have written in. And uh, we're going to help them pray for their needs. I got a guy, his name is upstairs. He's got stage four cancer. And uh, a lady, lady called me Monday and uh, told me that was her husband. And uh, so anyway, but he has, um, I forgot what the word was, but basically he abandoned her several years ago. And uh, so he, he probably needs uh, either healing or he needs a good dose of the Lord in his life. Amen. I tell you what, I, I, I thought about it today. I was doing some study on uh, different mythologies about uh, different gods, and I ran across the, something I'd mentioned the other day on Pastor Mike Online about uh, the Nordic or the Scandinavian nations, the Germanic nations that worshipped Odin and Thor and so on. Uh, they had a goddess, and this is common amongst uh, mythologies, even Greek Roman mythology. Uh, they all have a woman who is like works in hell. And in the, in the Germanic uh, mythologies, the Nordic mythologies, uh, her name is Hell, H E L. And um, so. I think we've got I think we've got the right place when we say hell, okay? And now the Bible actually verifies that. There's there's one place in the Bible, and there may be another one, but I uh, was looking at places in the Bible where it mentioned hell specifically. Hell hath enlarged herself, and hath opened hath, hath enlarged her mouth, and uh, so the Bible gives you this idea of hell being a woman, and then when you apply that, like in the book of Proverbs, where uh, she is the strange woman, and her mouth is the pit to hell, and when she opens her mouth, uh, she apparently devours things, and that's, that's how you go to hell, um, and so she has enlarged herself to accommodate, if, you know, the Bible says that hell was prepared for the devil and his angels, but with all the sinners now on the earth, she has had to make room for all the people that are plunging in there every day. When you think about that, uh, you think about the wars going on in, in uh, Russia and between Russia and, and um, um, Ukraine, and then the Jews. I don't know if you've seen the Gaza Strip and Gaza itself. It is, it is a total waste land. If, what a good way to get your country destroyed in two weeks or less, and that is invade Israel. Okay, that's a good way to get all of your stuff blown to bits, and they don't care. There are nations in this country, in this world. Boy, I'm preaching already. There are nations in this world, and I was sharing this with uh, Roy's nephew, that going even going all the way back to World War II, where certain nations like America, Great Britain, and others, we valued human life. Didn't matter what life it was. Didn't matter who they were. We valued human life, and we didn't try to use civilians as uh, as um, oh I don't know pr uh, protectors. Um, Hitler didn't mind killing all the Jews, all the Slavs, which is the Russians. He hated the Russians. He hated the Jews. He hated a lot of people. And anybody he hated, he didn't have a problem killing them. He wanted them wiped off the earth. 
That man was possessed with the devil. And he didn't have a problem even destroying his own German people because he said if they're not willing to stand up for National Socialism, they need to die. They don't, they, and he abandoned, by shooting himself, he abandoned his people to die for him days after he had died, after he killed himself. And that, that's, that's the way the Palestinians, Hamas, that's the way the Arab nations are. They, they have been putting weapons in hospitals, in schools, in daycare centers, you name it. They've put weapons there, they put missiles there, they put bombs there, they've put uh, themselves in there, and they're just daring the Jews to shoot something over there and kill all those people. That way the Jews look bad in the sight of the world. And you get these idiots in Congress who are protesting Israel. And I'll tell, you what, I'll tell you what's stupid. You want to hear what stupid is? This is stupid. They had a, had a transgendered uh, uh, get-together in Washington, D.C. over the weekend. And they had a man standing there with a dress on. And he's got the bullhorn, the microphone, and he's down with Israel. Down with Israel. Down with Israel. You know, we're for the Palestinians. Free Palestine. Free Palestine. And the commentator, there was an Australian news commentator. The commentator said, if you took those people on that stage, put them on an airplane and flew them to Palestine, they would be dead by the time they got off the airplane. And, he's, and they said, the most liberal country in the Middle East is Israel. There are more gay people there, homosexuals, transgender, that live in Israel than live anywhere else in the Middle East. And yet, they're putting themselves to the cause of the very people that hate their guts, hate their existence. That's stupid. Amen. Thank you for that. Now I'm wound up. Uh, John chapter 19. Let's go to the Lord in prayer and ask God to bless his word tonight. I appreciate you coming and being here. Father, we do love you and we thank you for this night you've given us. Lord, you've turned the weather cool already and and maybe we weren't used to that, but here it is. And Father, we just ask God that you bless your word tonight. Bless us, Father, as we give heed to it, as we listen to it. And I pray, dear God, Lord, that it would uh, sanctify us, that it would cleanse us, Lord. We've been out in this world all week, and we've uh, had a taste of what the world has to offer. And maybe, Lord, we've seen things that uh, invite us and, and tempt us and deceive us. Father, bring us back to your word tonight. And, uh, Lord, just heal us and give us, give us grace, Father, and have mercy upon us, Lord. And we thank you, God, for preserving your word for us and making it so deep and so rich. And, Father, we're going to look into our Savior, your only begotten Son, offered on the cross for the sins of the world. Father, we pray, dear God, that the cross... And the Savior Jesus Christ be magnified tonight in this place. And I pray, dear God, Lord, that we would give heed to the words that we're studying tonight. This is our salvation right here. This is where it's at. We just pray, God, that you would bless your word. And we pray this in Jesus' name and amen. John chapter 19. Yeah, praise the Lord. I, got the, I had to order a new, a new, new setup here. And... Uh, I hope this one lasts longer than the last one did. I don't, I don't remember having that all that long. And I, I just hate buying those extended warranty things because there's so much red tape and you don't, you don't really get that good a deal in my opinion. But anyway, John chapter 19. Um, so we have Jesus before Pilate. And uh, the Bible says, Then Pilate therefore took Jesus and scourged him. What, what purpose do you think that served? Or what, uh, we know that everything that happened to Christ on the cross was uh, prophesied beforehand either by the prophets, by the Psalms. In, in Psalms 22, we have the words of Jesus and we have them piercing his hands and feet. We have them parting his garments. 
That's all in Psalm 22. David wrote that a, a thousand years before Christ um, and so on. And uh, I love it when these people say that Christ knew these prophecies and he fulfilled them uh, to make it look like he was the Savior of the Messiah. Well, he may have got the words right from Psalm 22, but he didn't have any say in what the Roman soldiers did with his garments. He didn't have no control over that. They took his garments, the Roman soldiers did, parted his garments and cast lots for his vesture, exactly the way Psalm 22 predicted a thousand years before it happened. He, Jesus didn't have any say in how he was to be killed. And we're going to learn something. I've got Leviticus 24 written down way down there on the bottom there. And it's a fulfillment of the law. The law for what they accused Jesus of was not even fulfilled in how Jesus should be handled after he supposedly broke this particular law. And we'll see that. They took him and they crucified him and they pierced his hands and feet. Jesus did not have any control over that. He did not have any control over the crowd when they were mocking him and saying, you know, if you be God's son, then come down from the cross. And Psalm 22 uh, talks about that, how they mocked him and, they, and so on. He didn't have any control over that. And yet, just if we just take this one chapter out of the Bible, written a thousand years, plus a thousand years, before Jesus did this on the cross, and you'd have to say, that's pretty good shooting. Okay? And it would be like, it would be like if I took a rifle and I just, I just aimed it at an empty space in the sky and that bullet went and spun around the earth for a thousand years and a thousand years later it hit the exact target that I wanted it to hit, that I had predicted that it would hit and it hit that exact target at the exact time that I said it would hit it. That would be some good shooting. Amen. Okay, well, Psalm 22 is good shooting. So anyway, Jesus is, um, he's fulfilling these prophecies that are in the Bible, and he's fulfilling laws. So what do you think uh, when they scourged him? Why did they scourge him? What, what prophecy did that fulfill, or what law did that uh, fulfill? Does anybody know? Yes. Okay, so let's turn to Isaiah 53. Isaiah 53, that's, that's very, very good. There were requirements, and, you, and understand that Jesus paid the penalty for our transgressions. And there were penalties in the law that were not sentences of death. And um, so when they scourged Jesus... They didn't kill him in the process. Now, we're told that they used what, what they called a cat of nine tails. It was a scourge that had these leather uh, strips coming out of it. And they would attach metal pieces and pieces of, of broken glass or whatever. That's, that's what we're told. And it, it may be true. So, uh, but literally just ripping the flesh off of his back. And I imagine after 40 licks of that, I'm not sure how many people survived that. Okay? That would be something that would probably cause so much pain, uh, you would probably um, go into, what do they call it? Shock? Go into shock and uh, possibly, possibly die uh, from, from the, just the pain and the shock of it. Uh, not to mention the amount of blood that's being lost uh, from those stripes. But anyway, in, in Isaiah 53, so you have, you have, what I'm saying is you have laws in the Old Testament that God gave to Israel that when those laws were broken, the requirement was they were to be scourged. And I, I'll never forget, um, I listened to Brother Reg one time preach, and he is a real student of the law, and I, that's what I like about him. But he said, in, in the nation of Israel, there were no prisons put into the legal system by God. God did not have a penitentiary system, or a probation system, or a, or a, a prison of any kind. 
if you were found guilty of committing a crime, your sentence was carried out right then. And, it, and if, you had to, if you had to pay some sort of fine to somebody, if you, had to get, if you had to recompense somebody for something you had taken from them, then payment had to be taken right then. And if you couldn't pay the bill, then you went to be a servant until you did pay the bill. Um, but then, uh, or sometimes the, the, the Bible mentions an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. And so, I mean, you could lose an eye or, or whatever. There were, there were uh, things that the law uh, required scourging or uh, get, being given stripes. Forty stripes was the maximum. You're to never, ever give any more than 40 stripes. God wrote that in the law. And so uh, here we have Christ receiving those stripes uh, because it fulfilled the law in that he's, he is taking our punishment from us and he's having it done to himself. So in Isaiah 53, let's look at verse, uh, let's pick it up in verse 3. He is despised in men, a man of acquainted with He hid, as it were, our faces from him. He was despised and we him not. I'm going to stop right here just for a minute because, like I said, I've been studying some mythologies today uh, for a new Watchman series. And there was a... Uh, d Thor had more than one brother besides Loki. If you get out of the Marvel comic books and the Marvel movies, Thor had another brother, and his name was Balder. And Balder, they said, wasn't like Thor. He wasn't like Loki. He wasn't mean-natured. He wasn't a warrior. Uh, and they said that he was a very handsome prince of a man. He was very good-looking, very... Uh, well-natured, and so on. And when I was reading that, in a, a type of high Christ. Because Alder is um, he is pierced uh, for, I can't remember what the reason was, but he was pierced by a mistletoe arrow. And uh, that's what killed him. That he, there was a myth that said that anybody that shot arrows at Balder, the arrows would just go around him, that, that no arrows could stick to him. But only an arrow made out of mistletoe could strike him and kill him. And so he was pierced and killed in that way. And they say that his, his uh, death had some sort of sacrificial tone to it. So he is like a picture of Christ, or the Antichrist. And... Um, so here we have this Antichrist character who is very pleasant to look upon, very nice looking, very good natured, and so on. And here we have what's written of Christ is that he's, he's despised, he's rejected. Uh, we hid our faces. Um, we esteemed him not. He was filled with grief all the time. And, so, and, and we're going to see later on in this chapter uh, that there was nothing about his appearance that made anybody go, oh, wow, he's looking, Jesus looks so nice. Forget all those paintings and those statues you've seen of Jesus. That's not him. Verse 4, surely he hath borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. So he took the, the strikes, he took the smiting, he took the afflictions off of us that would have been ours and put them on himself. He was wounded for our transgressions and he was bruised for our iniquities. Now, just chase another rabbit here. The new King James Bible does not say that here. It changes one word and thus changes the entire meaning. He was wounded because of our transgressions and he was bruised because of our iniquities. Now, how does that change the meaning? Here, with the word for, is that he has taken the wounding and the bruising for us in our place and 
That way we don't have to receive it. That's what for means. Okay? He was for us being in our place. It would be like if, if John said, Melissa, I'm going to do the dishes for you. And then you see John next to you. You're doing the dishes because you didn't do it. But he's cheering you on. I'm for you, Melissa. I'm for you now. Come on. Get them done. Get them done. Come on, baby. And you're just going, scumbag. Christ received it for us so that we wouldn't have to. He paid the debt for us. He was wounded for our transgressions and bruised for our iniquities. The word because means that even though we got the bruising and uh, the wounding, he had to get it too. Okay? But it doesn't remove us from having to receive it. Okay? It would be like, oh, how can I put this? Um, I don't know. Anyway, uh, but that's the New King James. Okay? Uh, verse 5 again, the chastisement of our peace was upon him, and with his stripes we are healed. Now, all the charismatic people want to make this into Christ died on the cross so that you would never have a disease. That's what they want to make this into. Something today that, I mean, it blew me out of the water. I was listening to a guy... Uh, his videos interested me because he was talking about subjects that I talked about before and he was bringing up stuff about people in Hollywood and how they're possessed the devil and stuff like that. So I'm thinking, well, this guy's nice. I think I like this guy. And I only listened to two videos. And I got into the second video and he advertised something that when he advertised it and I saw what it was, I went, doggone it. He's a false prophet, and I know for a fact he is. And I'm going to probably do that tomorrow for Pastor Mike Online. Um, if you remember the name Mark Verkler, I've talked about him in times past. If you find out what kind of person he is and what he does, what his so-called ministry is, you'll know exactly why I went, doggone it. Okay? That guy, mm, divination, occult, Divination is what he's teaching. Anyway, with stripes, we are healed. The charismatic occultists and warlocks want you to think that Christ died so that you could have no diseases in your body, so that uh, you could have no pains, no problems, no ailments, no illnesses. Uh, Finnis Dake taught that, and yet he died of uh, Parkinson's disease. Um, um, oh, what's her name? Catherine Kuhlman taught this. And yet she, I believe she died of some kind of disease. Um, it goes all the way back into the early 19th. Amy Simple McPherson was another name amongst the Pentecostal uh, healer types that went around saying that everybody should be healed. And yet all of these people did not die of natural causes the way Finnis Dake said. The, they should die the way Moses did. All of them died of various diseases. And I, I almost, and there was another guy. He used to be a free will Baptist pastor up in Ohio. His name is Rod Parsley. He preached and he got big. He got really big, bombastic voice. And he could really put on a show in his church. And um, all of a sudden now he comes down with cancer. And he cannot heal himself. And God won't heal him. And in spite of all the positive things that he's saying and despite all the things that he's doing that he tells everybody else to do if they want to get healed it's not working for him and he has to go get chemo for his cancer and then then he comes out and kind of changes his tune a little bit well god's using chemo to heal lost people get get chemo and get healed okay lost people get that so don't be changing your story now you done lied to everybody and people 
still fall for it. I don't get it. But anyway, the healing that we get from Christ is the healing from the disease of sin. That's our infirmity. That's our biggest number one problem. What good would it do for God to heal your, uh, uh, your alcohol-written liver and God give you a new liver and then you live that way? Oh, praise God, God gave me a new liver. Do you die and go to hell? You're still going to die anyway. What good would it do? Verse 6, all, all we like sheep have gone astray and we have turned everyone to his own way and the Lord hath laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. Man, that's something. He is brought as a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep before her shearers is dumb, so he openeth not his mouth. He was taken from prison and from judgment, and who shall declare his generation? For he was cut off. Now how did, now how did Isaiah know that Christ was going to be in a prison and in a hall of judgment? How did Isaiah know that? How did Isaiah know any of this stuff here? Because everything that Isaiah said in Isaiah 53 happened. Every bit of it. Uh, verse 9, and he made his grave with the wicked. How, how did Isaiah know that one? That is, uh, I'm being, who's listening up there? They're saying my mic is cutting out. I don't know. All right, anyway. Um, how did Isaiah know that he would be taken from prison from, from the court of judgment? Um, let's see here. Who shall declare his generation? For he was cut off of the land of the living for the transgression. Yeah, he made his grave with the wicked. How did Isaiah know that? How did Isaiah know that Joseph of Arimathea would donate his grave to Christ for three days? How did he know that? And with the rich in his death, Joseph of Arimathea was a very wealthy man. That's how he could afford to have his own tomb cut into this. It was either a cave that he found and he bought or it was carved out for him. But it was only the rich people had got your own tomb. If you, uh, if you weren't rich, ain't no telling where you'd end up. But with the rich in his death, how did, how did Isaiah know that? Because he had done no violence, neither was any deceit in his mouth. Yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. He hath put him to grief. When thou shalt make his soul an offering for sin, he shall see his seed, he shall prolong his days, and the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. He shall see of the travail of his soul and shall be satisfied by his knowledge. Shall my righteous servant justify many, for he shall bear their iniquities. That's your disease, right? That's your, that's your sickness. Therefore will I divide him a portion with the great, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong, because he hath poured out his soul unto death, and he was numbered with the transgressors. How did Isaiah know that? And he bare the sin of many, and made intercession for the transgressors. So a lot of, lot of things there in Isaiah that Isaiah couldn't have known by itself. And they think that Nostradamus was some great prophet. He didn't know nothing. All right, now, back to John chapter 19. So he's scourged. The soldiers platted a crown of thorns, and we've covered that, and put it on his head, and put on him a purple robe. Why did they do that? Purple was a sign of what? Royalty. Royalty. Okay? And they put on him a purple robe, and they said, as soon as they did that, they said, Hail, King of the Jews. Okay? Now, here's what's interesting. That's what Pilate wrote, or had written, on his headboard there, above his head, the accusation and why uh, he was being crucified, why he was guilty of death. Uh, it is because he was king of the Jews. And this is what all the people are saying. Hail, king of the Jews. Eighteen times the King James Bible records that phrase, king of the Jews, king of the Jews, king of the Jews. Uh, Herod even said it. When Christ was born, where is he that is born king of the Jews? And so verse uh, four, uh, is, well, verse three, they said, hail king of the Jews. And they smote him with their hands. They punched him in the face. They slapped him in the face. They, they, they probably punched him in the ribs, punched him in the stomach. They just, they just beat him just out of anger and rage and Everything that just they hated him 
Pilate therefore went forth again and saith unto them, Behold, I bring him forth to you that you may know that I find no fault in him. Pilate is desperately wanting his, he's got somewhat of a conscience. And he's going, I'm not one of you Jews. He didn't bother me with what he said. If he wants to go around telling everybody he's king of the Jews, what is it? What do I care? If he's some nut job, then let a few people follow him. They'll all bust up before too long and you won't have to worry about it. Why is this guy always the target? And you know what? It is still that way to this day. When, when in this country, when liberals and other wretches of humanity want to go against what they call the onslaught of religion in this secular country, they always target Christianity almost alone by itself. Christianity. Meanwhile, we get Muslim immigrants in. Why? Oh, they have their religion. Oh, their religion. Oh, let's, t let's learn about your religion. Why don't you teach us about how you do things? And why don't, in fact, class, why don't everybody make out a little carpet out of, out of crayons and paper and let's all get down and let's do what uh, Raja does here. He's going to face Mecca and we're all going to bow like he does. They do that in public school classrooms. They do not target Islam. They do not target other, other uh, religions, including the religion of Wicca, which is taught, which I found out that um, the public schools in this town took their kids to go see Elemental. What's wrong with that? It's just a little Disney cartoon. It is Elemental Witchcraft. It is the four elements of witchcraft, which are four spiritual forces that a witch brings together to use to uh, cast spells or to bind people or to free people or to make themselves to enrich themselves or to cast love spells or cast literally assassin spells and each one of those four watchtowers those four forces are ruled over by a dragon Dun, dun, dun. So they don't, they don't have a problem teaching them witchcraft, teaching them Harry Potter, sorcery, teaching them all of these things. But some little kid brings, comes to school wearing a shirt that has a Bible verse on Oh my goodness, Johnny, uh, ma'am, uh, we have a problem with your son at school. Yeah, can you come and get him? Yeah, we're going to spend him three days. He's, he's wearing offensive uh, material. I called Hillsboro School um, I think it was over that guy Noah that wore the dress and they were gonna have some kind of deal and I said um, I said I don't, I don't want my son involved in that and they said well we don't really have any control over it I said well let me ask you this if I sent my son to school with a t-shirt that had a scripture verse in it. <laughs> Thou shalt not lie with a man. <laughs> and she said, no, he's welcome to do that. We can't stop that either. So, okay. I didn't have time to get the t-shirt made, but, but I'm telling you, they target. They've targeted, Christ. in fact, let me show it to you. Turn to Galatians 4. No, Galatians I'll let you know Galatians when I get there. It's before Ephesians, I know that. Galatians 4. Let me show you, let me show you what's going on in this world. And by the way, um, you can tell that the people who are of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, they are the children of God because of the people that are their enemies. They're hated all over the world. And, and right now, it's like I told you a while ago, all of these causes 
that if they went over and, and tried to get by with this in Muslim countries, they would be beheaded in the streets right then and there, and there wouldn't be any legal thing after them whatsoever. Um, all you have to do is say you hate Jews, and you're, you're, in, you're in this club. Uh, Al Hemphill told me, he worked in the um, Department of Justice for years, and he said, there's, Jew, he said there's, there's Jews in, all throughout there. And he said, I always try to befriend them and love them and, and kind of witness to them, you know, if I got a chance to. And he said, you would think that these Jews, after the, after the Holocaust, would be 100% all for an Israeli nation state in Palestine. He said, you would think that. He said, but they always consistently vote for liberal Democrat politicians who hate and despise Israel as a state. Their, their policies are for the Middle Eastern nations that want to kill Israel. And he said, those are the people that they consistently vote on and put in office. He said, I don't understand it. And I said, well, they're, maybe they're just as mixed up as God said they were. <laughs> okay, but anyway, in, in uh, Galatians 4, here's, here's why it happens. Look in verse 28. We have the we have the deal with Hagar and Ishmael and Sarah and Isaac. And Hagar and Ishmael are mocking Sarah and Isaac. And uh, Hagar thinks now that she's hot stuff because she slept with Abraham and gave him a son. And she thinks now that she's better than, than her mistress, Sarah. And so she's given lip to Sarah, and she's mocking her and mocking her little son, Isaac. And Sarah just says, uh -uh, I've had enough of this. And she goes to Abraham and says, Abraham, I want you to get rid of her. Get her and get her son out of here. So Abraham goes to God. He don't know what to do. He goes to God and said, God, what do you want me to do? And God said, do what she said. He's got a plan for it. And so here's what the Bible says. Now, um, Hagar and Ishmael in this allegory are playing the part of the Jews who are under Mount Sinai, under that covenant. Sarah and Isaac are playing the part of those who are uh, saved by God's grace without the Mount Sinai covenant. We're saved by a new covenant. So he says in verse 28, Now we, brethren, as Isaac was, are the children of promise. But as then, he that was born after the flesh persecuted him that was born after the Spirit, even so it is now. There's persecu there will always be persecution to Christ, and listen to this, his body. We are his body. Um, the article that the reporter wrote uh, about me, which I don't mind at all. I mean, it did not, it did not make, I didn't start jumping up and, you know, using a, a voodoo doll as a pin cushion and doing karate kicks in the air, you know, wanting to kill this guy. I didn't think nothing of it. What he wrote about me was not fair, but I understand it. This man's lost. This man has no regard for preachers or Christians or the Bible, or God, or anything like that. He has no regard for it. He has no respect for it. And that's what causes him to write the kind of article that he wrote and to say the things that he said. I mean, he could have just, he could have just said, you know, uh, uh, Pastor Ho He never called me Pastor Hoggard. He said, Hoggard! <laughs> Almost like that. Hoggard said this. But it was... He, he didn't just say, now, Pastor Hoggard uh, gives, gives forth the idea that these aliens are uh, demonic entities uh, as, as shown in the Bible. However, most uh, experts on UFOs say this. He didn't do anything like that. He attacked my character. He attacked my beliefs, okay, is what he did. And it, and it, it makes sense to me because he is born after the flesh, 
He lives his life after the flesh. He had, had this girl with him. They probably lived together there on campus. Uh, they probably, you know, he may smoke a little marijuana every now and then or all the time. I don't know. Um, I, I, I'm not trying to cast dispersions on his character. I'm just saying he's probably lost and lost people do what lost people do. And um, now we brethren as Isaac was are the children of promise. But as then he that was born after the flesh persecuted him that was born after the spirit. Even so it is now. People... I'm telling you, you, you are best served if you find yourself being persecuted. I believe you're best served by keeping silent and saying, God, have mercy. Let God handle it. Let God deal with it. I know as Americans, we're always wanting to fight for our rights, okay? And I'm right there with you. But I believe persecution is going to increase and we certainly have enough politicians in this country that don't like us. And they don't want our morality. They don't want our, even though that was the backbone of this country, they don't want it now. They don't want us around. They don't want us telling them what to do. Uh, and they don't want who we like for president. Okay, they made that clear. So anyway, nevertheless, what saith the scripture? Cast out the bondwoman and her son, for the son of the bondwoman shall not be heir with the son of the free woman. So, bottom line is, people, we know where we're headed. Don't be ashamed of that. But we know where they're headed, too. Pray for them. All right, now, let me get to this. And, um, verse 5. Then came Jesus forth, wearing the crown of thorns and the purple robe. And Pilate saith unto him, Behold the man. When the chief priests, therefore, and officers saw him, they cried out, saying, Crucify him, crucify him. Now, watch this. These men are hypocrites. And you're going to see it in a minute. They said, crucify him, crucify him. Pilate said to them, take ye him and crucify him, for I find no fault in him. Then the Jews answered, oh, we have a law. And by our law, he ought to die because he made himself the son of God. So I looked up the law that they were referring to. Turn to Leviticus 24. You tell me where the hypocrisy is. They were not concerned with keeping the law. They were concerned with getting rid of Christ. So tell me how they're wrong. Uh, I have the wrong verse. 16. Whoops. Verse 16. Where is the hypocrisy? Where is, where is it that they're wrong legally? ask you a question any of you ever drive 70 miles an hour in a 25 mile an hour school zone <laughs> okay what if the cop that pulls me over has me get out of the car get down on my knees with my hands behind my head and he's going to execute me on the spot is that right or wrong now was I wrong but was he wrong? And how was he wrong? Huh? How did he not abide by the law? Is what I'm getting at. Huh? Proper Look at that verse again. The person who blasphemed God shall be put to death, all the congregation shall certainly stone him. These, these hypocrites were not interested in fulfilling the law or keeping the law. They were interested in killing Jesus, period. And, that, and they said, 
crucify him. They didn't say, hold it, Pilate. We, our law said he's to be stoned. Pilate said, I'm going to crucify him. If you, don't, if you don't stop me, I'm going to crucify him. Crucify him. We have a law that says that, that he, uh, he ought to die because he made himself. That they, wouldn't, they wouldn't dare quote that verse. They knew it. They wouldn't dare quote that. Because they knew that they were being hypocritical in their uh, carrying out of the legal sentence that was required for blasphemy. Number one, he's not guilty if he is the Lord. Amen? And he is the Lord. He's the Lord of lords and the King of kings. So he's guilty only if He's not who he said that he was. And uh, I don't really care much for C.S. Lewis and what he wrote, but he did say one thing that was pretty good as an, as an apologetic for Christianity. When you ask people, uh, what do you think of Jesus? Well, I think he was a good man. I think he was a good teacher. I think he did some good things. Okay, but he said he was God. Do you believe he was God? Well, no, I don't believe he was God. Well, he said that he was God. He told people he was God. And now, now, if he's not God, then he's a blasphemer of God and he's a liar. You said he was a good man, but he's a liar. How can a liar be a good man? Uh, what was the Latin phrase that he came up with? Et Deus et malus homo. He's either God or a bad man. But he ain't both. Amen. Amen. Study the law. Study the law. I like this Bible because it is a legal book. And we are, you have a contract with God that qualifies under the written terms that are in the book. Do not follow anybody who wants to change the written terms of this book, either by altering the words of it or replacing them with something else. Mark Berkler.